you're going to be called, that would help. And then that would cut, cut down some of the um, the feedback with a bit of luck. OK, um, Ken, I, do you want to do you want to open the meeting? Yeah, first of all, um, we'll apologise now for any technical issues we might encounter. Um, this isn't really the way we want you to get information out. We, we very much prefer the, the face to face. Uh, and especially face to face with a pint in their hands. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more enjoyable that way and we can share the information a lot easier. Um, but there is a lot going on. There's been some um, announcements with regards to Pedimore that David will cover uh, shortly, uh, which has really sort of dictated how quick we, we wanted to get out, because what we didn't want was people getting information and coming back to us and going, you never told us, or, um, why didn't anybody tell us this was happening? So this is why we, we've we've sort of set up the the, the team's uh, version, but we're also going to cover uh, some other things uh, as well. Um, so really, that that's about it. So over to you, David. Really, if you want to move on, yes, uh, just remind everybody that the meeting is actually being recorded. Right, he got and if everybody has the mad desire. They will be able to watch it in about forty eight hours on YouTube. Right. I can't wait. Let's, I'll be interested how it turns out. Um, I don't think we've got, I haven't got any apologies. Um, so what I was going to do is move on to the general ward updates. Um, I mean, the, the saddest news is, of course, that we uh, we lost uh, Jeff Gilbert, who's our, who was our well-known community volunteer, larger than life personality. Uh, the past proprietor of his useful shop, uh, a volunteer on just about everything you can name, involved in the mill, the New Orleans Valley and Jones Wood. And, um, you know, this is a major loss for 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 Warmly. And I am sure we all we all feel that very, very deeply. Yeah. And the time will come uh, to um, sort out a memorial to Jeff and it may be several. And I'm grateful for David's suggestion of uh, meeting up the rugby club, and we'll do that in July. But but at this point, uh, I just thought it would be a good idea if we just just have a minute to just to have our own reflections of Jeff's life and um, and thank you know for his his contribution. So if we could just be silent for a minute, or or a, a, a few moments anyway. Okay, I mean, it's not a minute, but we've remembered him anyway. So, um, Ken, there's an update you, you've got for us um, on on the library, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, we, we did put it on Facebook, um, but just in case anybody missed it, uh, Wormley Library has now reopened uh, Monday and Wednesday uh, to start with, um, where people will actually be allowed to go in and browse uh, for books rather than just turn up and, and drop them off or collect which is a, a huge step forward. Um, the intention is, is that the library will also open on Saturdays uh, at the beginning of September. There are some staffing issues at the moment because I think because of COVID, I think uh, there's been the occasion where some staff are maybe taking advantage of um, taking early retirement. Uh, we've lost quite a lot of good staff from the libraries, but they are going out the way to recruit at the moment. So all we would say at the moment is, is it might be a little bit shaky to start off with, but they will get there. Um, so, but it, it's, it's good. I, you know, certainly David and I were really pleased that Wormley Library was getting reopened because it would have been all too easy uh, having closed it for the, the excuse to, you know, uh, the, the people have got used to it not being there. It'd be a lot easier just to say, well, we won't bother. Uh, but we kept on top of it, and I'm glad that they listened. So the library is now open again. Um, next one, uh, update on the boy racers. Um, again, we, we always get complaints uh, about the noise from the A38 and on certain nights. Um, David and I have got a, a very good working relationship with the police on this. Uh, we can assure you that they are acting on it. 
Um, we try to share as many of the the postings that uh, West Midlands Police will give us where they've caught people, they've taken the cars off them. So the, 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 the methods that the police are, are, are adopting uh, are working. The one thing to bear in mind is that the injunction that's currently on the A30 is not currently in place. There's been some legal issues uh, in London, funnily enough, and we're waiting on the outcome of those before we apply uh, to get the injunction re revisited. Um, however, the, the police are on the case and they've made some significant uh, arrests and they've, some, they've made quite a, a few seizures of cars. Uh, on top of that, uh, I think it was David's suggestion, because the other thing we got uh, reports on is that some of them are disappearing into the side roads because they know the police are watching A38. Um, so we've got a, an, an evening speed watch set up uh, for Monday night. Uh, at 8.30, and we'll be doing that in Webster Way to start with. Um, and then we might move about to some of the other roads, uh, like Kingsbury Road, etc. cetera, um, because these guys just scatter. As soon as they see uh, a police car in the A38, they, they scatter. Uh, but the police are working very hard in it. Uh, David and I will be going out with the police again. Uh, and the officer that, that we've spoken to has actually said, yeah, you can come out with us, uh, but be prepared to do over 150 miles as we as we go around the areas chasing these people. So it's 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 quite a, a wide area that, that's got to be covered. Uh, but we will obviously feed all that back in again. David, do you want to add anything to that? Because you've spoken to them recently. Yeah, I, I think it's just pleasing that we've got Central Motorway Patrol Group, our neighbourhood team and the, the local inspector actually working to, together on this one. And the, the speed watches that we'll have will be, will be as it were, real ones. We'll have a pro laser and we'll have police in attendance to um, issue notices of intended prosecution if we, we get them. Uh, it's just, especially when well, we come on to this with, with say, roadworks on the A38, you know, we, we are quite concerned that they'll migrate to other roads where, frankly, they could pose even more risk than they do on the A38. And I don't want to say too much, except that we, we do have a plan so that we will have an unmarked car, which will... Or well, the police will not not us all our cars are unmarked but the <laughs> police will have an unmarked car uh, which will act as a spotter and then they'll have a marked car which will be actually doing the the checking the speeds so we're going to give this a shot we we hope it isn't going to be a problem but we need to have something in place the the other thing which we'll come on to of course with the pedimore construction is that the A38 will have some overnight lane closures. We don't quite know how that's going to affect the boy racer problem. We're, we're hoping that with a single carriageway, normal vehicles will slow down the flow enough to make it really unattractive for them. But we, we simply don't know. So we're liaising with the police and um, hopefully we, we'll have a plan, uh, uh, have a plan for that. Uh, I think that that covers that. It's just something that will won't go away. There is um, an ANPR camera actually on the A38 at the moment, um, which I won't tell you where he is, but there is one. So the police are getting some data, and as Ken said, they they are really they're really putting a lot of effort into this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the next I think thing we need to update on is really. The um, which leads us on to the construction for for Pedimore, doesn't it, Ken? I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that the only before we got onto the Pedimore yeah. thing, the only other one that, that that did spring up today uh, was uh, some travellers. Yeah. Um, I mean, over the last few weeks, I think everybody will be aware that certainly Sutton Coalfield has suffered quite badly uh, from uh, travellers. Uh, and they think nothing about cutting through fences. You know, they've got angle grinders now and they're quite happy cut cut through fences. N not wanting to be too smug about it, I think the measures that we put in place two years ago 
uh, which didn't look pretty when we did it uh, with the bonding uh, of um, Calder Drive and also uh, Candiford Park. Um, we believe that, or we know from residents that they have had a look at those uh, areas and they've turned around and gone away. Uh, and it's proven so effective that it would appear that we're now bonding all over the place. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. Uh, however, we, we were made aware that some turned up on, uh, on Maybrook Industrial Estate. Um, and it was funnily enough, it was one of the PCSOs that, that highlighted it to us today. Uh, we've highlighted it to our officers. Uh, they are going to have a look. However, uh, we just picked up on Twitter and again from CMPG, bless them. Uh, and there's a lovely photograph on there of a police car pulling a caravan away. Uh, and effectively what it is, is that uh, Tracker has found three stolen caravans on Maybrook Estate. So uh, I, I was quite, really quite pleased to see that happening. Um, so we'll, we'll, wait, we'll wait and see. But obviously David and I always adopt the same attitude with, with travellers. We don't want them. We won't have them. And if we do get them, we'll get them moved as quick as possible. Um, but I think certainly with uh, some of their favourite areas, we've made them pretty well and accessible, I think, David. Yeah, um, we put a lot of work into um, uh, patrolling the, the, the ward and talking to owners of land, which we thought was vulnerable. So we talked to the rugby club. We got um, good reaction from them. Uh, they managed to forestall one invasion of their their pitches, and uh, we had chats about security measures. And they, the second set, I th think, certainly kept the travellers away. And uh, although it's not in our ward, it's a neighbouring ward, we did speak to St Coldfield Football Club, and they're now put in bonding as well. So they they've followed suit. Um, and, and there were other conversations we had too, including with IM Property. IM Properties actually did a, they were pretty uh, pretty good in, in stopping them in the first place. So the, the only area where we got them settling was in, unfortunately, in Minworth. But the area of land that they were on is um, actually the Sam Trent Water Board property. So we were a little bit handicapped with that. We did actually get our officers involved and they served them notice. But I think we need to work on our relationships with the police, with the travellers. They, they weren't as quick to um, take action uh, as we would like. But <coughs> fortunately, we didn't have too many problems with them and they've now, they now moved on. Um, so we took, we're trying to get older Seven Trent at the moment to um, make that secure. And we have an offer from IM Properties to um, accidentally drop bags of gravel and stuff on the areas that they could use to access the land. But they're not going to do it unless Seven Trent agree. So, so we're pursuing that at the moment. And we, we'll, we'll always look at measures to um, protect our, our land. Yep. Um, so so that, that's that. And I think uh, the, um, so the, yeah, we're really quite chuffed about that. I think the, the, the next thing on the agenda, David, is the, is the clean air zone. Um, we're just going to mention the construction oh, for, we, for Paddy okay, Um It kind of fits into what we were saying about the A38, because they will be lane closures there, and that will uh, affect uh, people travelling later on at night. We don't know the dates, uh, but the... I am going to be on site on the 5th of July and plant will turn up later on. But we've had a, we had a lot of concerns expressed because people were thinking that uh, the contractors would be getting onto the site via Lindridge. Uh, and that's not the case. It's going to be via uh, Warmly Ash Lane and the two camp compounds are located off there. So... And, and it's only going to be for a relatively short period because once they've created the roundabout on the A38, that's where the uh, the majority of plant access will will be from. So I am I'm going to be talking to residents in Warmley Ash Road and Warmley Ash Lane to explain what's going on. Um, 
we've got a dedicated email address and I am being quite keen to engage with residents. They're, they've sent out a, a, a community newsletter. So if there are problems, um, you know, I'd urge people to get in touch with us and, and I am committed to um, answering queries and dealing with any problems that arise. So, so that's that's all going off. Um, and as you say, Ken, the the next item really is to we're going to bring the clear aim air zone forward for discussion. And I think the officer uh, needs to get off to to another meeting. I think. Yeah, that's fine. If if you're happy, I'll I'll um, share my screen. Is that okay, John? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Is technology caught up yet? Can you see that? We got that. Thanks. Yeah, great. Okay, right. So, so good evening. Thank you for inviting me to the ward meeting tonight. My name is Tasneem Hussain, and I'm representing the Clean Air Zone um, team today. I'm just going to start. Oh, sorry clicked on the timer there. I'm just going to start by showing you um, a short video um, on the clean air zone, which will hopefully give you a little bit of background. Um, presentation will last around 10 minutes and I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. I'll just move on to the video. Hopefully that works. Can you hear that OK? Yep, great, yep thank got you. it. I think that doesn't. Can I suggest everybody switches their cameras off? You might be a problem with the broad. Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll um, I'll skip to the next slide if that's okay, and then I'll share the link to the video in um, in the chat. Is that okay? Yeah, and we'll forward it on as well, Tasmin, for you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, please do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, let's um, back then. OK, so um, that was quite a powerful video um, that's used as part of our um, introduction to the clean air zone, and I will definitely forward that on to you. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, following legal action by Client Earth, central government ministers have ordered a number of local authorities to come up with proposals to tackle illegal levels of air pollution in their area. Uh, the implementation of Birmingham's clean air zone was delayed due to the pandemic. However, we did do a soft launch earlier this month on the 1st of June. Um, in the video, we show that uh, uh, air pollution is a national health emergency and we need to reduce the number of premature deaths um, in the city, especially amongst children. Um, air pollution has been linked to many medical issues and in December 2020, for the first time, air pollution was listed um, in the UK as a cause of death on um, a young girl from London, nine years old, who sadly passed away of an asthma attack. Um, so that's, you know, it's fundamental that we we do something to tackle this. Um, after London uh, and Bath, Birmingham is the newest city to launch um, a clean air zone uh, to drive down harmful pollution levels um, and protect public health. To improve, improve air quality within the city, Birmingham introduced what's known as a category D clean air zone. So you'll see on the chart there you've got A, B, C, D. Birmingham has introduced a category D um, and you can see the vehicle types that are being charged in each of those categories. 
Um, so uh, Birmingham will be charging owners of the most high polluting vehicles to drive in certain parts of the city um, unless they have applied for an exemption. It's important to note that this is not a congestion charge, though so not all vehicles will be charged, only those that do not meet the emission standards or um, have been given an exemption. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so um, Birmingham's Clean Air Zone uh, Type D was soft launched on the 1st of June. We commenced charging on the 14th of June. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the CAS Type D, so we've got buses, taxis, HGVs, vans, and cars are all um, subject to the charge if they are non compliant. Um, we don't charge motorbikes. The map on the right there um, with the blue boundary is showing you um, where the CAS zone is. So it basically covers all roads within the A4540 Middleway Ring Road but you can stay on the middleway. So there's no charges for going around the middleway, but if you enter any of the areas within that, which includes the A38 and tunnels, um, there will be a charge. The zone is operated 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days a year, and there is a daily charge, um, and the charge runs from midnight to midnight. So you only pay one daily charge per day, but you can enter the clean air zone as many times as you like. But if you cross the midnight threshold, you will have to pay for two days. Um, sorry, I did brush through that a little bit. But so if you pay the clean air zone, you enter, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, you go back at three o'clock in the afternoon, you don't have to pay again. It's just one charge per day. But if you're having an evening out in the city, you go to, you know, Broad Street at 11 p.m. and then you come back at one o'clock in the morning, um, You there will be, a two day charge because you have crossed the midnight threshold. Um, is it OK if I leave the questions to the end? Is that all right? Yeah, thank you. Um, so payment um, uh, will be online. So the government are managing the payment system. So there's an online um, website that you can use to pay or you can call the central help desk. You must pay um, within a 13 day window. So you've got six days in advance on the day or six days after your visit, you can pay. If you don't pay within that window, unfortunately, there is a penalty charge notice um, process which will automatically be triggered. Um, so that's that one. I'll just move forward to the next slide. OK, so uh, we've got uh, the government have provided something called a vehicle checker. You may have seen this on, on our website. Um, this vehicle checker uses data from the DVLA. So you put your number plate in and it will tell you whether your vehicle is um, uh, compliant or non-compliant. If your vehicle is subject to the charges, um, you do you can either apply for an exemption if you have uh, meet the criteria. If you if there's no charges, you do not need to apply for exemptions or take any further action that that is indicating to you that your car meets the standards and you don't need to do anything if you drive into the zone. It's absolutely fine. Um, so roughly, I'm not going to read all the things on the slide, but if your vehicles, um, so diesel, we've got Euro 6 or, or better, so that's roughly 2015, there's no charge, petrol Euro 4, which is roughly 2006 onwards, and then you've got gas, electric and um, the hybrid vehicles. Uh, so we have introduced a number of short term exemptions, um, so subject to criteria, you can apply for those online. For example, if you are a resident, so somebody that lives within the clean air zone, you can apply for up to two years exemption. You'll initially be given um, a, a, an exemption permit for 12 months and then after 12 months you have to reapply. If you work in the clean air zone, um, so you're not living in it, you're, you're living elsewhere, you're driving into to the city centre to work in a location within that within that boundary you're earning less than thirty thousand pounds a year you work 18 hours or more um, and you supply the relevant evidence you can apply for a 12 months exemption so that's known as our workers exemption uh, we also have some exemptions available for commercial vehicles and we have a medical voucher scheme in place for some of the medical facilities um, in the clean air zone including the children's hospital and we have temporarily included uh, Millennium Point for the COVID vaccinations as part of the uh, medical voucher scheme. So they, they're given a given a voucher, you scratch off the pin code, you apply 
all the information online and then that will void any charges. Again, it's only for those people that are driving non-compliant vehicles. That's the important point. Um, additional exemptions are also available. So, for example, disabled passenger tax class vehicles are automatically exempt, as are some specialist vehicles, um, emergency services, ambulance, police, etc., and also some um, special vehicles like, you know, gritters, rolled rollers, cranes, etc. Uh, last couple of slides. Hopefully, I've still got you all with me. Uh, so Birmingham has received £35 million worth of funding from central government to support the introduction of the clean air zone. And this has been divided as follows. So we've got two pots of £10 million and one pot of £15 million. So the first pot of £10 million is, is available for the workers exemption that I talked about earlier. And that's part of a scrappage scheme where um, we have um, procured a, a partner, Motorpoint, where you can go in with your non-compliant vehicle and you can either purchase a new vehicle from Motorpoint and we'll, they will give you £2,000 off of that vehicle or the £2,000 is given as credit on a SWIFT card, which is via transport for West Midlands. I've got a further £10 million available for what's known as the heavy duty vehicle funds. So that's to support SMEs in the West Midlands to upgrade and replace some of their non-compliant vehicles. And then finally, the largest pot of grant funding totaling 15 million has been made available to the taxi community. Um, so just to give you a quick update on where we are. So 14th of June, we started um, enforcing the clean air zone. So that made it a chargeable CAS. So quick update on there. So we had 6,000 temporary exemption permits issued to both residents and workers. So that was at the on the 14th of June. That's obviously gone up since then. Uh, we've paid out £1.7 million to the taxi community and over £330,000 of funding was committed to SMEs for the HDV fund. We've also carried out um, a large amount of communication. So there was a big comms campaign. You may have seen some of the posters, um, billboard notices, digital advertising, etc. We did lots of webinars um, uh, and they're available to download online off of our off of our website. And we just provided lots of information around how to apply for the exemption, what charges are, um, you know, the main point about checking your vehicle, making sure that you, you know you don't pay for something that you don't need to. A uh, couple of points then, just as a reminder, so check that your vehicle um, is compliant or not. So use the government's vehicle checker. Important to note that there's no notification sent to you if you've entered the clean air zone. So that it's up to the driver's responsibility to know that they've entered and whether their car meets the standards or not. Um, and like I said, penalty charge notices will be issued for non-payment. Um, second point, check if you're eligible for an exemption or financial support. So, you know, do you live in the live in the clean air zone? Do you work in there? Have you got a commercial vehicle that's registered in the clean air zone? You know, there are some support packages available. Um, so that needs to you can apply for those all online. Um, in order to improve air pollution, we all need to review our travel options. And there's been a huge investment in public transport, including the extension of the tram line. Um, you know, if you live locally or within walking distance, obviously, you know, there's lots of um, options there promoting walking or cycling. Um, so some of those, those further details are available again on our website. Uh, last couple of slides are for businesses. So if you're a business owner or employer, make sure your staff and visitors are aware of the clean air zone so they understand how this will impact them. Communication is the key here. You know, if you have an office in the clean air zone, your staff may be eligible for the workers exemption. So you can remind them. So, for example, at the children's hospital, we, you know, we've worked with them. There's lots of staff there that are that hospital is within the zone and we've encouraged them all if if applicable to apply for the workers exemption. Um, you know, can you put things on your newsletter? Can you update staff um, via your own websites, etc.? Um, due to the pandemic, obviously, some staff are still working from home, so you may think, you know, it's not an issue right now, but plans need to be made, put in place um, on in terms of uh, when staff are due to return later this year. If somebody wants to um, reclaim uh, the £8, you know, what is your policy? Are you refunding that? Are you encouraging them to use public transport? How is that all going to work? 
uh, final checklist then. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, London and Bath um, went live with their clean air zones um, before us. So we are the next ones to implement the clean air zone, but we'll be closely followed by Portsmouth, who will be introducing a clean air zone later this year. Important for businesses to prepare, um, make suppliers aware, make your customers aware, staff and visitors, et cetera. Um, and also think about, um, uh, so they can think about any uh, potential charges and how do they pay? Because we're having quite a lot of queries about, you know, I I've entered the zone, I'm not quite sure how I pay. Uh, so all of this information is um, provided on our website and we've got links um, over to the government's payment systems. That concludes my presentation. I hope you found the information helpful. Um, my aim was to just give you a brief overview on why we needed to introduce the zone and a little bit of detail around air quality and um, obviously the location of the zone and support available for individuals and businesses. Further information is available on our website, which is listed there, brumbreeds.co.uk. Uh, we also have um, an email address, cleanair at birmingham.co.uk. Uh, thanks for listening and I'll be happy to address any questions. I'll just stop sharing my screen. So, so Ken, you, Ken, you've got a question, haven't you? Yeah, it's a like general comment, but a, a question that's been raised by a business owner um, with regards to the charging. I mean, obviously, there are various opinions on this, uh, the implementation of this clean air zone, but uh, I think it'd be, it'd be wrong to sort of shoot the messenger. Um, I don't think that's fair. Um, I've been contacted by a business who have a fleet vehicles. Okay. Uh, and with regards to charging, if his, with the London charging zone, uh, congestion charge, what he's done is he has registered his vehicles on their system and therefore he no longer he doesn't need to rely on his drivers to tell him oh by the way i went into the charging zone because mm. once a month he gets an invoice from transport london for any of his vehicles that have gone into, into the, the chargeable zone yeah he tried to do that with birmingham's um, because with the, the greatest will in the world, he reckons that his drivers might not be the brightest of people and might not always tell him, oh, by the way, boss, we went inside the zone. So yeah. he tried to do the same with Birmingham, and be told, sorry, we can't do that. So the first thing that he's going to do, or, or the first time he's going to find out about the system not working really, is when he gets a fine because his driver hasn't told him he was inside the zone. That is completely and utterly bizarre. You've got a company that's more than happy to pay, but we've got we've said we'd appear that Birmingham set up a system that won't allow them to, but he's quite happy to charge him a penalty for late pen for late payment. So um I mean I'll 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 take that question away, but we the Birmingham's clean air zone um doesn't have an auto pay function. And as I said earlier, the payment of the clean air zone is all down to central government. So they're the ones that are running the systems there in terms of payments. But they do have an option for um, fleet owners to set up an account with them where they can register multiple vehicles, which yeah, will make it easier. So every time they go in, they don't have to type in the registrations and all the details. But there's no automatic notification of entering the zone or, you know, people have asked for direct debit. Um, well, I, I think I think it's a bit, a bit well, exactly direct debit. If, if we've got a system in place that it's, it's quite oh. happy to send out a penalty charge, it should be quite capable of sending out an invoice. Um, no, the system hasn't hasn't doesn't doesn't do that. So. No, but it should surely. I I think the payment system is separate to the penalty charge notice system. So they're, they're two different things. Um, uh, so at the moment that, you know, we don't have that isn't in scope for the project of setting up um, some sort of auto payment system. Uh, we have had some inquiries definitely about that, um, which we are pushing back to the government's payment system team because they are responsible for setting up the payments, invoicing, you know, auto payments. They've got this, like I said, they've got this 
uh, system set up where you can set up multiple vehicles, but there's, there's no automated system at the moment. Oh, and certainly I think you should you should certainly push for that. The other yeah. one that we've we've also yeah, got, and I think other... um, you know clean air zones. Like I said, there's only London, Bath, and Birmingham at the moment, so they are going to be coming up across the whole of the UK, and it's going to be a big problem for businesses. So the government have to do something to make that easier, because like you said, you know companies are going to have to rely on people. Did I enter the zone? Well, I'm not sure. And the first they know about it is they'll get, they'll get a penalty charge notice through their letter, through their letterbox, which isn't going to be ideal. So I'm sure something um, we will definitely raise it as part of our learning from from the introduction and feed that back that these yeah. are the types of inquiries we're getting. And I would say the, the other one that has been raised with us um, is this idea that if you go past midnight, you have to pay it twice. That is going to kill the entertainment industry. Um, certainly Broad Street, um, the, the ICC, the Ret, you know, people that, will, that go to the theatre, uh, et cetera, who will go and see a show and maybe come out and have a meal. That isn't going to happen anymore. All the shows are going to have to finish uh, before or give everybody enough time to get out of a car park get out the show and get out the car park to get out the zone. Yeah. Um, you know, it's going to kill the entertain a lot of the entertainment industry, the way the charging system has been set up. Well, I think um, that's definitely um, a, a good point, but also please remember that not every vehicle is charged. I think I'm sure when we did a survey, it was less than 25%. Or, I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's a very low number of cars that are non-compliant that are entering the city so not everybody that goes to the theater they're not all going to get charged the eight pound it's only those vehicles that don't meet the required standards yeah but some of them are going to get uh, some of them are going to get charged 16 pounds yes obviously yes, yes which is it? which yeah. is bizarre yeah we are working with um uh, transport for west midlands to try and improve some of the um <laughs> public transport options especially recognizing um you know the the the, the leisure trade after after hours etc digbeth um the theater etc uh, you know there's staff as well that need to come in and go home exactly. at different times you've got the hospital that are doing shift work so there are lots of um uh issues there and i think you know public transport needs to be improved um, to try and give people another option to get home. So if somebody's finishing their shift at five o'clock in the morning, you know, if there's no buses, they've got no choice to to take their car. So you know, how how can we support those people? Yeah, I think I think it, it is quite harsh, um, especially those that work in shifts who start yeah. a shift late and finish it early. It should. Yeah. It's, I would have thought it, made, it would have made sense to have it based on number of hours rather than yeah. set times. Okay. Well, I'll, hopefully, I'll leave that with you. Anyway, thanks very much. I'm okay. going to ask one question, and I'm going to bring in Terry, who's got one. Okay. Um, when you, um, uh, if you're familiar, familiar with the the Dart charge and similar charges like that, you can go on with your registration number, and you can actually overpay. So you can pay for your trip, and you can make another payment. Now, this is quite useful because. On the occasion that you forget or you don't remember until too late, you've got a little bit of room. Can you can you in fact overpay? Is there an account facility for that? No, there isn't an account facility. So you 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 would log in, you would go go onto the payment system with you put your registration in, it asks you to confirm this is the vehicle that you want to pay for. And then it will present you with a series of dates. And um, like I said, you can only pay six days in advance or the day of your entry or six days after your entry. And those will be the only dates that are presented to you on the system. Um, if you, you know, if you entered today, you would go onto the system, select today's date, pay your eight pound, and then you would exit. If you if you think actually I'm I'm working all week in the city centre, I need to pay for the rest of the week, you can pay in advance up to six days and um, that would be the only only facility there but you couldn't pay for next month or you know if you booked your theatre tickets and thought well actually I'm going to the theatre in September I'll, I'll pay now while I while I remember it doesn't do that. Okay um, Terry you, you wanted to ask a question and then it's uh, David afterwards. Got you. Thank you chairman. 
Um, I'm a little surprised by what you say in terms of the government are insisting that these clean air zones are put in. I believe Leeds City Council were going to put in a clean air zone, but have now withdrawn it because of the effect of evening commerce that uh, Ken alluded to. So, could you comment on that? Is it a choice that Birmingham made to do, or is it the government making Birmingham do it? Thank you. So, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I will try to answer some of it, but I won't have too much detail, obviously, around Leeds, etc. But Klein Earth took the took our government, so took the UK government to court due to illegal levels of air pollution. They won their high court battle. The UK had to do a survey of air pollution across the city, across the country. All those cities that had illegal high levels of air pollution were mandated by central government to introduce measures to improve air quality. So the clean air zones is a way of improving air quality. And if you remember from a previous slide, I, uh, if I can load it up, you've, you've got those different types of clean air zones, A, B, C, D. Um, and depending on how high your air pollution levels are in the city, you could choose which one of these. So if you introduced a clean air zone A, you know, you're only charging buses and taxis. Is that going to do enough for you to bring down your air quality levels, uh, air pollution levels and meet the quality standards that we required? So um, it was before I joined the project, but 2000. And 18, I believe there was a huge consultation, lots of work went on, they did lots of um, surveys, etc. And in order for Birmingham to meet the required air quality levels, clean air zone D was what was required. So that was basically the highest level of clean air zone charging most vehicles um, that are non-compliant to um, uh, uh, and, uh, not enter the encouraging them to not, not enter the zone. Leeds, I, I'm not 100% familiar with the the whys and you know why they didn't go ahead, but I know that they did have a plan to go ahead. The pandemic has obviously made people have a little bit of a rethink. We were due to go live next summer, last summer, um, and obviously with the pandemic, we delayed that until um, June. So Birmingham does have a air pollution um, issue. We do have air quality monitor monitoring going on across the city. Um, and I can share a link um, where you can see what, what the readings are um, across that. And then th this is information that we have to report back to um, the government. Their department is called the Joint Air Quality Monitoring Unit. We have to report back to them um, with, you know, how we're doing, what's the air pollution level uh, are like now. And then, like I said, if we don't hit the required targets, the council will be fined for illegal levels of air pollution. And that's obviously that's something that is a unaffordable and secondly is not something that we want. Can, can I just can I just add something to that? Then? Yeah. Yeah. Certainly it's the government that, that, that said implement clean air zones. It was Birmingham that said they were going to put charges in place for that. Yeah, the government said clean up the air. They didn't say clean up the air and charge motorists. They said clean up the air and it was Birmingham's decision on how they did it. That's right. Yeah, well, of course, all local authorities had to come up with a way of doing it. And like I said, at the moment, it's London and Bath, Birmingham, you've got Portsmouth next. There's, you know, Manchester. There's loads of different local authorities that are looking at introducing some clean air zones or some way of reducing air pollution within their area. Uh, David, you had a question. Yes, please. I've got a couple, really. One observation. Bearing in mind the length of time which the clean air zone restrictions were being discussed, it appalls me that the comments that Terry's already made have not been addressed. Secondly, you mentioned Manchester, and I note from a fresh release recently that Greater Manchester are not introducing their clean air zone until May 2022, and they are not imposing the same restrictions on vehicles. Basically, what they're saying is that they are all, that from the start, they will exempt private cars and motorcycles from charges, whilst vans, buses, registered coaches and wheelchair accessible taxis are already exempt until 2023. 
and eventually those were, those other vehicles will come into play at a much later date. So how can Manchester adopt that attitude? Are we saying that Manchester is less polluted than Birmingham? Possibly. I don't. I don't have the information there. I'm afraid. Well, this is a bit. With respect, this is. I'm not obviously uh, going at you personally, but this is something which needs to have been looked at before the system was introduced. There seems uh, to be a total uh, lack of thought on implementation. Uh, well, there's been a very thorough business case presented to central government several well, years. Clearly not from the, the answers you're not able to give us on the questions that Ken Wood has raised. No, I, I, I agree. I'm not able to answer the questions that the councillor has asked and I, I can certainly take those away and um, I'll liaise with John after the meeting and we can arrange a response for you. That's not a problem. Okay. Secondly, what is happening to the money that's collected by these uh, charges? Is it ring fence? What's it going to be used for? Uh, so the money that that is collected from the clean air zone charges is reinvested into improving, um, for example, public sector, uh, public transport and in other infrastructure projects. Right. Well, we're in Sutton Coalfield area. A lot of people travel into Birmingham from Sutton Coalfield. What are their options? We've got no prospect of metro. Sprint buses are nowhere to be seen. So, you know, you really are penalising certain areas of the city. Um, well, I think we, we are working closely with Transport for West Midlands and in terms of improving bus services or, you know, looking at timings, looking at accessibility. There's lots of work going on behind the scene. Yeah, you're, you're saying you're talking to Transport for West Midlands, but this charge is going to be imposed, what well, is imposed now. Surely these things should have been discussed and bottomed before the system came into play. Um, but as would you respect your question was around the income the income has only started on the 14th of june so we can't make uh, plans to spend money that we haven't received yet but you're anticipating quite a high volume of charges i would have thought well we we're, we're hoping that we don't make any money would be great wouldn't it because it's not a money making scheme it's about trying to improve air quality and the less people that drive in with high polluting cars that's that's the only way we're going to achieve this. This will be similar to parking charges, Paul, where hopefully people wouldn't come in and park, but clearly they do. I mean, we can all idealise about the situations, but we've got to take a pragmatic and practical view, surely. I, I get tired of organisations saying lessons will be learned. We're talking to people about it. They should have been talking about it months ago. They, but, there, are, there are lots of discussions that have already taken place um, and a plan is in place on what sort of things that can can be improved um, and that any money revenue raised will be reinvested into um, infrastructure projects to improve. Uh, well, where, where is that plan at the moment? Can we see it? Is it, is it published? Uh, no, it's not published. No. There, there is some information on our website around alternative travel methods and also um, some information regarding reinvestment of, of the money raised. It's a wish list, I'm sorry. It's not a practical application, it's just a wish list, but I'll, I'll hold there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got another question from uh, Tammy. Tammy, would you like to ask your question? We've got showing a, showing a hand. We'll be on mute. Tammy, can you can you hear us? Can you unmute? Hi, good evening. Hi there, can you hear me okay? We yeah. can hear you now. Oh, you able to hear me? Yep, go ahead. No, not on mute. <laughs> we can hear you. Yeah, I can absolutely hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. If you're having you able to hear me now, I, we can hear you fine. If you're having trouble, uh, you can all. I mean, we don't have to answer the ask the question tonight. If you want to email us with a question, we will undertake you get the answer. If you're having trouble, but if you want to. Try your question now. Have another go. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Yes. Hello, is there that is... any better? Yeah, we can Hi hear there. you. Um, it was just a quick question going back to um, Tasneem. When you mentioned about um, sort of the... Sorry, I've, I've lost that. I, I think we're having trouble with uh, your connection. Um, Barry, I'm actually, I can... I can hear you fine, okay, if you can. I can hear you fine now, if you... I can hear you fine now, if you can with me. Right. Thank you. Um, it was going back to um, Tab Tasneem, uh, when you mentioned about money going... Thank you. Um, about money going back into public transport in certain coal fields. Um, the question that I, I want... There oh, yeah. is there Tell is a question there is a question box at the top of the toolbar. Is um, is living in Minworth? Uh, is that any better? Uh, um, if you want to, I'm happy to. Um, oh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. David, I think it better to get yeah, the I right think we're in. Gonna have to. Look, tell me. Uh, I understand the general question is about public pr transport provision in Minworth. And, uh, you know, this is something that's close to our hearts. We want to improve it, obviously. Uh, that's very much going to be part of the Pedimore development. And there, is, there are monies available to, to improve that. And that's probably going to be the first source of, of improvement in Minworth. And that's something that we we will deal with and we'll bring to another meeting. I think as far as an answer goes on money from the clean air zone, I, I think we've got the gist that the money isn't there and they haven't decided how they're going to spend it. So, But if I've not answered that, your question, or given enough information, please email us and then we will make sure you get a proper response. I can um, I'll, I'll put something in the chat, Tammy, just in case you can't. Uh, so I think you're having connectivity issues. Well, we're keen you get an answer. I think we're going to have to deal with this offline. OK, um, right. I, 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 are there any any other um, questions? Do we have? OK, OK. Well, Tommy, we'll um, we'll deal with that separately. Um, so we're just going back in the uh, the agenda. So we're, we're just going to very quickly talk about highway changes on, on Pedimore. Um, so we, what we've done is we've uh, emailed those um, those residents who usually come to meetings in Moonworth, who addresses we have, and we've given them details of what proposals are being made by IAM properties for a number of junctions. So, so tonight I think that probably the most controversial one is going to be Kingsbury Road, Cottage Lane and Water Orton Lane. And what I would, what, what we've been discussing this, Karen and myself, these proposals come from the developers all the proposals do, and they are designed to deal with traffic flow problems, i.e. the problems that arise from the development. They're not designed to deal with the problems we experience with traffic or with HGVs coming down Water Orton Lane. Now, at the same time, <laughs> you know, we are very keen to deal with those problems as part of any proposals I am bring forward. But it's going to be a very long job, this. It's going to take quite a while. We're at the start of it. Uh, Birmingham City Council will have to uh, look at them in detail. And there'll have to be some very detailed consultation. So what we've done really is just ensure that residents have got information at the earliest possible time so they can see what's possible, make their comments, and then what we're going to do is once restrictions have eased, we're going to have some face-to-face -face meetings 
round the table and get IM properties to discuss parts of it. So it's very much, this is just the very early stage. This is where we stand and uh, just, just to keep you informed. I mean, if there are particular questions at this stage, well, we're, we're happy to take them. Over to you. Tell me, are you, is that a legacy hand or are you going to try for another question? My apologies, it's a legacy hand. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Look, we'll all do it. We, we'll uh, just get the hang of this by the time the restrictions ease and we can kiss it all goodbye. I, um, to think I used to be questions? an IT trainer was amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I hope that you see where we're coming from in this. You know, we're very keen that Minworth residents uh, and indeed for the other proposals that uh, residents of the war generally get an opportunity to comment. But it is very, very early days uh, and we will do whatever we can to try and address the problems of HDPs and make sure everyone has a voice. Um, Ken, did you have anything to add on that one? I think you, you've summed up, David, in as much that it is very early days. I think when we had brief discussions with with Birmingham um, Highways the other day, yeah, we're looking at least 12, 12 months probably. Um, and obviously, yeah, a lot of it will depend on, on how IM get on uh, with their development as well. Um, so I think it is very much a case of just trying to make uh, residents aware of what is kicking about what might happen, but there is nothing set in stone. Um, and we are keen to make sure that we we sort of take advantage of what I am doing to try and make sure that we get improvements elsewhere. Uh, and certainly we, we we know that we have got some real issues in, in with certain roads in Menworth that we would love to get sorted. Yeah, I mean, we, we did this with the um, improvements to the Astor roundabout in the past. We, we got some improvements that we, we really needed as part of that work. And, and we look to do that every time something comes up, see what, what we can do as part of it. So we'll undertake to keep you all posted mm -hmm. and, and hopefully do it in person because that we could have shown you the plans tonight. You're looking at the screen. How on earth you're supposed to make sense out of it, I don't know. So it's far better to do it in person around a table. Um, so just going to go back to the agenda that we've got um, John Mole, who's going to give us um, an update on Commonwealth Games funding. John? Thank you very much. In, I will I will try and admin and also run a presentation for you. All right. If you can all... On the grounds it's the appliance science, if you can all scream when you see my application, which is, shouldn't be that screen at all. Bear with me a moment. Help if I get the right one. Right. Can you all see that? Has it kicked in? Yep, that one's kicked in, John. Yep, Fantastic. Right then. I'll make this as snappy as I possibly can for you all. As you might all be aware, we are going to get the Commonwealth Games. Now, we have had a little bit of healthy cynicism about the whole thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to offer every single ward a pot of money to try and celebrate the community games. So most important question of all, how much has the ward got? We have got the grand total of £22,100 to spend. It's not a huge sum. And what I would stress to you all is that can go in the blink of an eye. So if anybody's got any ideas and we find that we actually over allocate, I'll be quite happy to work with the groups to see if there's any alternative funding out there that we can possibly find. But what's it all about? It's a universal small grant and it is a small grant. The funding goes from being, to, being able to apply for £1,000 been able to apply up to £5,000 with a maximum grant that we will be awarding of £10,000. It's there though to help our communities get more locally active, active and to get the general impetus for the Commonwealth Games to come to us all. 
three key themes. I can't get my words out tonight, and that's on the water. Three key themes. Actually, I challenge anyone to try and say that. We've got get active, ready, steady, fun, and celebrating culture. So if you put an application in, it has to hit one of those. Now, the first round is closed, but round two is open till the 30th of November, so there is no rush. I would rather see a really good bid come in a bit later rather than a rush bid that comes in too early and might get refused. The first element is get active. Obviously, we're talking about the Commonwealth Games, so getting active is a key element for the Games. It's a sporting event. So we're looking at projects coming into us that have got stuff about active mobility, community games and sports days. We've already seen some fabulous examples of that coming across the city and active streets and parks, because what we want to see is we want to see our green open space used more. And I know that's a key element for this ward. Second element, ready, steady, fun. We want to see community projects which help ensure your local area is games ready. Now, that can be everything from putting out bunting to having a th a formal, uh, themed displays of flowers. I've even seen a choir being set up across the city that's going to start singing from different Commonwealth countries. But it's also about having fun. Now, the key element is here. Remember to keep the link to the games. I've seen a lot of applications coming in that are really good worthy causes, things from domestic abuse to renewing a canal down the south side of the city, but have made no relation whatsoever to the game. So it is Commonwealth Games money. So we have to make certain that the Commonwealth Games is the key element to the whole bid that comes into us. And the third element is celebrating culture. It's about looking at Birmingham's place in the Commonwealth and seeing what we can do to spread the history. I've seen some really good history projects coming in now of certain cultures coming in to say, yep, we're from the Commonwealth Games. My granny or my great aunt used to live except in some parts of the, of, the, of the Commonwealth and how they're actually sharing their story. So it's about what we can do again with that key theme. It has got to link to the Commonwealth Games. The core criteria is really wide and as most accessible as we possibly can do it. So first of all, you have to make certain you've got a ward plan. And here I have to commend both your ward councillors because you've had a ward planning for a long, long time. So we won't have an issue with that. There'll be no blockages whatsoever. We need to look at how the, the bid can actually add value both to your ward plan, but also to your local area. What can be funded? Again, we're keeping this as wide as we possibly can. So funding can be used to cover most types of community activity. We will quite happily pay for core costs. We'll look at revenue costs. We'll even look at a new and existing project if it can be tweaked to make certain it hits the Commonwealth Games. And we'll certainly look at one-off initiatives as well. Two ways to actually submit your application. Now, you can go into the Birmingham City Council website and you can just submit it online. Now, I have heard a couple of parties saying that they've struggled with that. So I've got the good old fashioned Word documents available. Councillors, I'll certainly pass that to yourselves, but if anybody wants a copy as well, you can come through to myself and then all you have to do is complete it and submit it to the email that's at the top of the screen, which is the NDSU at birmingham.gov.uk. And I'll put that in the notes and we'll make certain we circulate it out later. Three different types of application forms, as I've already stated, up to £1,000, from £1,000 to £5,000, and then £5,000 up to £10,000. £10,000 is the ceiling. I've got to stress that. And I'm going to keep labouring this point. Please, please, please align your bid to the Commonwealth Games. The questions are fairly simple. We need to know your ward. And again, if you are pitching to more than one ward, make certain that you specify that. You are allowed to do so, but please, please, please make that very, very clear in the application. You need to talk about what your projects and idea is and how your project actually aligns to your ward priorities and your funding criteria. The ward plan in this ward is very, very good. It's, it's, it's wide and it encompasses just about everything. So you won't miss out from that particular side. You need to talk about how you'll deliver your project, how you know you've been successful. That could just be the number of people that perhaps come to a small mini games. Do you have plans for the continuation of the project? Now, this is quite important because if we start talking over £5,000, we'd like to see some sort of continuity if possible. So if we're setting up, say, a mini games in a local school, how are the school going to be able to pick that up and run with it for a long time? Do you have any match funding? That's a key element. Don't always think where you're talking about match funding of talking about money in hand. You could have a team of volunteers. Now, volunteers are classed as match funding. And I always argue that a volunteer per hour is worth at least £10 an hour. So there could be some match funding there if you start to think about it.
And if you are going for capital projects, we will need to see quotes. Once you get to the £5,000 plus, if you're applying for larger sums, it is important to think about the legacy as stated. A legacy is what you can do to make it work afterwards. A very good example of this is if you're setting up a small walking group, can that small <sighs> walking group continue longer than 12 months? I always say it's, this is very much similar to when you were writing um, an exam question, read the question, reread the question, and then read the question again. And what you will then be able to do is you'll get a good picture of actually what you want. So take your time, don't rush it. If there are any questions, contact me. I am there to help as much as I physically can. There are also two resources that is actually going to be available to us. Now, these are really, really good resources for any, any community group in Birmingham. We've got Locality who are coming in to assist us. And Locality are a national group that work really well with small local groups. So Locality will be one of the one of the groups that you can refer to. And the other one is a local charity called Birmingham Community Matters. Now, what we're doing with some of the applications where they are good applications, but they haven't really, as I keep stressing, gone to keep the key themes of the issue of the Commonwealth Games, they will be referred to Birmingham Community Matters to see if they can help these groups make them a bit stronger. So what happens next? We've got an application forming, fabulous. All bids will be reviewed by Birmingham City Council staff just to make certain they fit the criteria, that they're value for money, and it's not a rogue agency out there just trying to find a way of making a quick buck. From there, a specific ward forum will be set up similar to tonight. What will happen in this case, and I can't spell, I've just suddenly realized that, is there is a third sector agency across each district across the whole of the city who will be arranging the ward forums. All of you will be invited. I have got to stress that this isn't an extra. This isn't an external agency coming in who are just trying to take over the process. They are there purely to help make this process happen. So and in our case, it's an organization called Spitfire Services. They have got a very good reputation in Birmingham, work in the Edmonton district. Um, if we could just lose microphones, I'm just getting some terrible feedback here, if at all possible. Thank you. And all approved applications will then get paid for, be paid via conditioner grant aid. Now, conditioner grant aid is a wonderful thing because we can actually make a payment happen within 48 hours. So it will be done via a BACS process. And the conditioner grant aid as well will also pin certain agencies in. So if they say that they're going to see 100 people, then we will expect to see 100 people to actually get the money. And it's quite simple from here, councillors. If there are any questions, I am happy to assist as much as I can. I think we've got one question. Terry, you've got a question? Thank you, David. Yes, it's uh, it's not word specific. It's borough spe specific, really. Uh, John, you mentioned in your ready, steady fun element that uh, bunting and flowers could be part of the Commonwealth Games. Um, yes, um, Sutton in Bloom, which I happen to be the chairman of Sutton in Bloom, um, are going to put complementary flower planting in with the with the Commonwealth Games colours. We, we've gone quite a few, quite a bit at the moment of extra wildflower planting around the borough, and we want to put in some extra sculptures. I would very much like to put some wildflower planting in complementary colours in Stonehouse Road, but uh, I'm getting some objections from one of the local officers from Birmingham to doing this. Uh, I don't think there's any way you can help me uh, to do this. I mean, we want to make a real splash of Monmouth Drive, Stonehouse Island, Stonehouse Road, Park Drive, um, Town Gate, etc., Balmere Gate. It's, it's important to our town that we, we make a proper representation for the Commonwealth Games, as well as the Queen's Jubilee, which I'd like to speak about in a few moments. But if you could help us, John, I'd be most grateful. Yeah, perhaps you need to, if you speak to me separately, Terry, we'll see, I'll see what I can do. I can't make any promises because I don't know what the situation is there, but I'm certainly very much aware of your commendable works that you've done before. And provided, as I said, we've got that nice connection, Commonwealth Games, and you've already nailed it. You're looking about doing flower beds in, the, in sp specific colours for the Commonwealth. That sounds like a very good, plausible plan. Uh Ken, you, you've got a question as well, haven't you? Yeah, just a great one. Uh, first of all, th thanks very much for that, John. 
Um, and certainly from David and I point of view, John, you you, you can work wonders. You've, <laughs> you've worked wonders for us before, so thanks very much for that. No pressure, uh, Chancellor. Just a, a bit of clarity, really. Uh, obviously, there's, there's these application forms that, that different groups uh, can fill in uh, to apply for the funding. Do they have to set up separate bank accounts? You know, have an organisational bank account or does the money get paid to an individual? Or where does this... Uh, right. What's it's the it's mechanics? Excellent and valid question, Councillor. Normally, we would get quite stroppy from the city perspective and we'd start talking about, no, you've got to have your own community bank account set up. You've got to be on our vendor approved list. What we will be doing, if you've got a small group or you've got a particular project where they don't have a separate bank account, we will be trying to identify whether we've got any partner agencies that can babysit the money for us so that we can pass them over directly as a BACS account and then they can pay that particular organisation. So we've already looked at that and thought, right, this could be a blockage and we're going to do everything we can to stop it. Right. Okay. But, so that's that's where the, the governance side comes in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll be one of, I'll be the one that's actually signing the money off. So I know it'll be done properly. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, do we have any other questions for John? I can't see anybody showing. OK, well, well, thanks, John. As as Ken says, you um, you have uh, performed wonders uh, in the past, so no pressure here at all. <laughs> I'll do all I can, councillors, you know that. OK, um, the next item um, is indeed uh, the town councillor updates and um, as uh, as Terry says, he, he's um, going to give us um, some some comments or about the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, uh, Terry. Do you do you want to do that? And then we'll ask Derek to um, come in and give us an update on the uh, town council's war memorial plans. Thank you, Terry. Chairman. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. I um, as as a royal town, I'm particularly keen that we celebrate Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. Um, it's going to take place over the weekend of the 2nd to the 5th of June. So we start on the Thursday, the 2nd of June. And, and the Queen at that time will have been on the throne for 70 years. It is a unique achievement. No other monarch has ever, or I believe will ever, uh, be, be, on a, on, be, um, be on the throne for that length of time. It's, it's just so, such an exceptional uh, achievement that we we will need to properly celebrate it. Um, there's going to be four days of celebration across the country. On the Thursday, there'll be a Queen's Birthday Parade, Troop in the Colour, uh, in, in obviously in, in London, uh, with with a, a number of soldiers and bands and stuff like that. Um, there'll be Jubilee Beacons, which we probably saw some years ago when we celebrated the, the 50 years. On Friday the 3rd of June, there'll be a service of Thanksgiving in St Paul's Cathedral. Saturday, there'll be Epsom Downs, the Queen's favourite uh, occupation, horse racing. And on Sunday, and this is the one I want to come to particularly, there'll be the big Jubilee lunch. This is where I hope there'll be lots of street parties, lots of flowers, lots of bunting, lots of colours throughout our town, especially throughout our ward. Uh, lunch parties can be big or small, can be small street parties or big street parties, tea and cakes or a barbecue or whatever you wish. But I think it's important that we start to plan for these things now. Um, in London, there will there'll be a, a Jubilee pageant featuring over 5,000 people from across the UK and the Commonwealth. So this merges in with the Commonwealth Games. That's why I'm particularly keen that we, as a town, we we uh, we properly celebrate both events in in colour and uh, and in our celebrations. And uh, I just hope everybody will get on board with these things. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks, Terry, for that. Um, Derek, do you want to um, come in now and update us <laughs> on the town councils? Warmly, yes. War memorial plans. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Well, as you all know, the war memorial in uh, Warmly has been re 
uh, furbished we'll call it, and it starts on the 2nd of August and it will take approximately uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, there are an all, the photographs have been, well, artist impressions have been given out some time ago. Uh, and the um, if they anyone wants them, they we can still provide them. The uh, furniture, there's going to be new street furniture. In other words, new benches in the area with the Sutton uh, Coalfield logo on. And it's all being paid for by the Sutton Town Council. The um, and what we've got to remember is that we are only um, what's the word? Anyway, we, we're looking after it. We we don't own the War Memorial. The residents of Warmley own the memorial, and we own we just look after it. And that's what we intend to do. Now, if anyone wants any any photographs, I think. They were given out a couple of years ago or of the printing and uh, or the artist impression. Uh, but if anyone wants them, they're still there are some still available. So 2nd of August, it will start uh, and the contractors will take approximately, as I say, 10 to 12 weeks. It'll all be ready. Uh, we're hoping that we can have a rededication service prior to the remembrance service in November but that's another that's another story anyone who's had the chronicle today will see the, there's an article in there with an artist impression all about the war memorial thank you Mr Chairman uh right uh we've got questions Ken Ken you've got a question there uh, it's not so much a question it's just to to say to to both Terry and Derek um, I know how much time and effort uh, these two guys have put into getting this project off the off the off the, up and running. I know there's been lots of frustrations along the way, um, but certainly I think uh, it's fair to say, David, that you and I are really chuffed to get it up and away at long last, uh, and we'll be really pleased to see the, the the finished article. But I just wanted to underline to everybody that the amount of work that Terry and Derek have put into this. Uh, and it, sh it should be well appreciated by everybody. Thank you. No, Ken. I, I think that's a very fair point, Ken. I, I, the other thing I would say is that um, we we have always felt, and I, I think the word Derek you're looking for was custodian, just to be smug. That's that, yeah, that's the ah. word I was after, David. Thank you very well much. Well done, David. Um, but we we've also felt that you know we we've been custodians before and we we've had um we've had work done to the war memorial in the past and this is uh, much in excess of of what we could contemplate so it, it, it is to be welcomed and um yeah we look forward to it all being completed uh prior to, and it and looks as if we'll be doing it well before the uh, the service and that's that's if, if, Mr. Chairman, if I can preempt maybe an article that will go in in the future um, chronicle, we are trying or we're going to try and contact, if there are any, any descendants of the soldiers who are named on that um, memorial, both for the First and Second World War, so that we can invite them along to the rededication service. Now, I, I do know that there is one name on there, and he lives in Warmley, Mr. Baird, who is, I'm not referring to him, but the, the, all the others, because there's a guy whose name is on the War Memorial who is buried in St. John's Church, name of Kelly. I don't know whether, and he came from Ash Farm. I don't know whether there's any um, other people uh, still in the area of any relatives of them, cousins, uncles or aunts, uh, and also one of the names on the War Memorial, he was the son of the Vicar of Warmley. So, uh, yeah, D Derek, we have had um, a go at this before, or rather Aid, who's just put his hand up. He's been involved in this before as, as, um, as part of the services that were planned. Um, Adrian, do, do you want to come in now on that? Yeah, it was just to say that I know downstairs we've got uh, 
a kind of booklet all about the war memorial and all the different names and i think that even involves some contact details of some of the next of kin still alive so is that something that that is useful then more than happy to to let you view that or take it away for a bit so that's absolutely great hey, thank you very much indeed no problem okay um that's great thanks hey. so do we uh, have any comments or questions on those two elements the town councillors have presented on or indeed any any questions for them uh, terry did you want to add another comment then i, I just did questions? please david yes i just want to say thank you very much for what you said we, we have tried really hard and have been as frustrated as anything about the war memorial um i have spoken to ben cook aides um curate at uh, st john's about a dedication ceremony i think it's most important that we treat this with the respect it properly deserves um and just a comment it's, it is an aside and I, I'm, I'm, I, I will try and progress it and um, there's been some comments about um, turning the, the war memorial square into a jeff gilbert square i i I, I'd love to do it if we can do it. Um, war memorials have a very special set of legislation and, and we all know that you can only do certain things with them. Uh, we will properly uh, reflect on Jeff's contribution to Warmly in the proper way. And I think Dave has already said it at the end of July and David Cook has said it, end of July, we'll get together and we'll properly discuss it and, and we'll help as much as we can to properly represent Jeff Gilbert and his contribution to Warmler. Thank you very much. No, 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 thank you. Um, I mean, we, we're um, committed to doing that. And, you know, all I would say is that we've kicked this idea around already, these ideas around already, Callum and myself, and it may well be quite a few different things that we do. We're not, it needn't be one, but I think we, we do have to um think in some ways what jeff would want and and i i, I take that sort of a little bit tongue-in-cheek because i think that jeff would probably say just chuck me in a box and forget me um but we we, we, we can't do that so sorry jeff we will do something um but i think that it needs to be more than just naming something after him because the link will be forgotten and you're quite right it is a war memorial it, it's got to be a timeless thing that is for our war dead and nothing else uh, but we'll have plenty of other, other opportunities so do we have any any other questions or comments for for our town councillors just scanning down do we have any no i did you want to add something else terry or is that just um a hand left up no i'm i'm so, happy with so, work go on terry fine fine Dave. thank you very much no thank you very much for the opportunity to say what i've said and, and thanks to Derry because he's worked as hard as me on this thing so. <laughs> okay uh right with no, with no question further questions no that's fine and and thank you for your your contribution um just Going back to the agenda, we did have an item. I don't think we have Matt Lee's of the um, the, the the shrubbery, save the, the shrubbery on here at the moment. We did invite him, but things got overtaken. So we were told that the shrubbery was closing and then we got the welcome news that thanks to uh, Andrew Mitchell being involved as well, that the shrubbery would would remain open and obviously the shrubbery has been part of the landscaping warmly as long as i can remember not obviously... not 90 years mr chairman right well i said as long as i can remember <laughs> 90 years doesn't cut it no so um well obviously you uh, never no i'm not going there but uh, <laughs> it's been Al almost of almost almost <laughs> so um it's been part of the scenery and we're we're glad that it's it's going to continue and we wish it well so i think that's kind of taken care of itself so what would the last item we've got is matters of general war concern and and questions and uh, welcome any questions for either for ourselves or our town councillors at this point 
So throw it, throw it open. Ken, you wanted to say something? Yeah, thanks, David. I'm, I'm just thinking that as we've got aid uh, online um, and not wanting to put them on the, the spot or anything, uh, I just wondered if you could bring us up to date with anything that St John's are doing in the church in, in Minworth. Yeah, with, with the, yeah, I suppose the easing of restrictions. Is there anything that you would like to get out there? Uh, not really. I mean, we're slowly meeting back, but obviously still under restrictions. The the big changes really is Ben Cook, who was our curate, has now become associate vicar here. So he's staying and he's, his focus will be now on Minworth much more um, and leading the, the church plant down in Minworth and good links with the school down there. We've had a new curate that's just joined last week called Claire Reed. So mm -hmm. she's a new vicar, a female, which is wonderful. And so uh, we we just welcomed her, and obviously, once we're kind of back into so hopefully fairly normal mode, we look forward to remembrance, rededication of the war memorial, and other stuff. Hopefully, starting to get going in the autumn term. Yeah, so certainly, certainly, from David's and my point of view, we look forward to being able to get back in there and back into St John's and doing our advice bureaus and taking advantage of the the excellent food. Fabulous! Can't <laughs> happen soon enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I believe, and I think the the police will want to be coming back as well yeah. because it, it's a great way of of getting together and sorting out issues. So, so we really do look forward to that. Yeah, I think September. We're sort of aiming for September. Right. For that kind of stuff. Good, good. Um, any any other any other questions? Yeah, I think we got Stuart. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks for pointing out. Yeah, I've just got you. Stuart, do you want to come in? Stuart, you're on mute. Can you hear us, Stuart? There we go. I'm unmuted. You're OK now. You're live. I uh, wondered if you can give us give us an update on the community facility of Horsefield Drive next to the Taylor Wimpy development for which Birmingham City Council is holding three and a half million pounds for the past four years. I mean, I yes. think another facility that comes in the conversation about naming things after Jeff Gilbert. Um, yes. So, so we we had it, this went through cabinet. We got agreement to uh, after some considerable work to go forward with tendering for a design construction and running of that centre. And then the the world fell about us because COVID happened. So at this up to this point, it has been very difficult to enter into a tendering process because the, the companies that we would want to tender have obviously had other things on their mind. So we are now in a situation that I think fairly shortly, as things get back to normal, we can re we can go back into the tendering process. The decision has been made, so we know we can go ahead. It's just getting the time right and making sure that we get the best bid. So the three and a half million that we've got, and trust me, we want to spend this, is it's there, it's not disappearing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will be tackling that. Uh, in parallel with that, um, we've been talking about 106 monies, which have been sitting there for ages as well. And David knows only too well the battles we've had on that. And Ken and myself, we've, we've come to some conclusions on that. So we're hopeful that we can announce something on that this year. Uh, we've got some plans that we're looking at the community orchard, which if you remember, was a piece of land that had no owner. Well, it has an owner, but it was supposed to go into a trust, uh, but it wasn't stipulated how the trust would work, and nor was it stipulated how the trust would be funded. So we've been dealing with that thorny problem. We think we've got a solution, but we, we will be going into that a bit later. So it's Trust us, I mean, we really, we fought every step of the way to get this moving, and we're still fighting. But but there is light at the end of the tunnel, said he, using a cliche. Just, does just, that does that help at all? 
It helps, but the concern I've got and others have got is we're now four years into the seven years we've got to spend this money. All uh, right. Well, we do we have an extension. Up. We we have we uh, in terms of the building, I think that we can get that the building done in the time. Um, and, the, and the money we, we are convinced is adequate to the task. In terms of the 106, we have been talking about an extension of the period for the spend, uh, and that would go back to planning accordingly. So we have, no, we have noted that, and I think we can deal with it. So it, has it been too long? Yes, it has. Um, we, have we have had to go back to our chief executive twice now on the same issues. Um, it has been a monumental battle, and I have to say that planning have been as difficult as possible throughout it, uh, and un unhelpful to say the least. Uh, and David will know the battles we've had, but I think I think that we are within reach of, of getting it sorted. We really are. Can I add something there, David? Certainly, you can. You're as wary or as we are. Yeah, well, we've been waiting so many years for the fundamental things in, in, in the planning conditions to be implemented. I'm very tempted to use the word incompetent and I don't use it lightly. And I have threatened to issue a formal complaint to the Ombudsman if necessary. I've been trying now for well over 12 months to get a response from highways on associated highway safety matters. I had one last week, which I'm going through in some detail. But it is absolutely pathetic, the delay in getting these simple things sorted. Um, but I won't give up and I'll keep in touch with you. Well, nor will we. And, and I would just say that had we not collectively gone back and fought through planning, we would have never even reached this point because planning had no idea what they were going to do. They'd still be talking to the YMCA who clearly had unrealistic plans for the land. Uh, so we've done just planning one. work for them. We have done their consultation. We have provided all their, their the ideas and the work. And in many cases, they've just let us down. But we will get there if it kills us. And, and just, to add, yeah, just to add to that, David, I think that certainly David and I would, would join you in, in using, and we have used the words incompetent yep. uh, on a number of occasions during those, those conversations uh, with officers. Um, it has actually been quite heated um, on two or three occasions, um, so it, it's not been a good one. And again, going back to the, the frustrations that, that Terry and Derek have uh, experienced uh, and are still experiencing on some things, trying to get the city to move on things at the moment. Um, the carte blanche answer in most things is no. Like when I wanted to shut the, 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 the laybys on the A38 to get them cleaned, the initial response was no. Until I went back and said, why? Where does it say legally we can't shut them? And then the next weekend they shut them. Um, and while I'm actually, well, actually, while I remember about the, the A38, they're going to be um, putting in a more permanent closure on that first uh, lay-by on, I think it's the 19th of July. They've got some of these big, heavy, water-filled barriers that they're going to put on, on that one. Um, we've also asked them to look at some fencing on the southbound one that will make it a, a damn sight more difficult to throw tyres over. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But on the 19th, I think they're also intending cutting the grass on the verges. Um, so there'll be some lane closures for that as well. So I think what we'll be trying to do is get them to maybe try and tidy up the central reservation as well. Whilst we're oh, thinking yeah. and you're yeah, discussing yeah. with the city what's happening with the community's um, facility, could I make one immediate plea? I understand the Birmingham City Council have now taken ownership of that site. Could they not clear it so that residents have at least some <laughs> assistance, some outlet for for using it whilst we wait for the final discussion? Well, if they've That's taken it on, if they've taken it on, we're not aware of it. No. 
uh, and the policy all along has not been to take it on until mm. until basically the tendering is complete because they 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 pass on any responsibility to the current owners yeah it's disgusting yeah well we we battled we battled this a number of times the town of wimpy homes who are looking out at this eyesore yeah well in, indeed um but they know who is to to blame for this because it is actually still their their responsibility and and the downside of this is that if we took the responsibility on too early we would be spending our 106 monies mm. on on maintenance which we really wish to spend on a, on other things and we, we've looked at sort of doing some clearance work the trouble the trouble then is for what period and we just we just don't know if we were looking at say a couple of months and you say right come on take it on a couple of months and do some work that's one thing but of course with covid we, we just we don't know when that's going to happen so I mean, We've been it's a bit frustrated there as well. The we're in, aren't we? It's taken four years to get to the current situation. We've been on about this since 2017. Well, I've been involved with this since before I was elected. Yeah, I this, can believe it, Dave. Um, and I can remember the consultations for this thing starting. And I, I can remember people saying uh, everybody wanted this this housing estate and how they were so so keen on the the YMCA and I can remember going no nah. uh, and I've been involved with it ever since and you know Ken's came in and joined me on this and thank God uh, it's been a very it was at once sometime it was a pretty lonely thing but yeah. we are battling together I can assure you on that one no, I do appreciate that I'm not being critical he, he, gets, he gets annoyed and I'm not then I get annoyed and he, so so we swap over from nice and nasty regularly. <laughs> Good on you. Yeah. So yeah, I mean we we we'll, we haven't been idle in this uh, lockdown. I can assure you. But equally, trying to get things moving with officers working from home and the, it, it's it's it has been a nightmare. Um, Terry, did you want to say something else again, or is that? Another is your hand still raised? Uh, I think you muted as well. Apologies, David. I'm sorry. I, it's technology it defeats me. <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. You won't be the last person to leave your hand up, and I can assure you. So I, I think that if there are no more questions, I think we've we've dealt with the the issues of the the meeting. Um, I mean, all I'd say. I mean, I think. You know, Ken will will join me in this. We we really look forward to having a meeting in person. It, nothing nothing makes uh, up for for, for that. Um, and I thank you for your forbearance in looking at stuff on a screen and 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 dealing with all that stuff. It, I think we're all thoroughly fed up of it now. So we do look forward to seeing you all for a proper meeting. Uh, in the near future, Ken, do you do you have anything else to to add? Yeah, I think as I said that at the beginning of the meeting, actually, yeah, to to be able to get together and do a face to face, uh, and to look at big drawings rather than tiny yeah. sketches on on screens, etc. Um, to get back in the to get back to the boat, uh, and uh, yeah, familiar surroundings uh, will be really good. Yeah, yeah. No, indeed. I mean, the, I mean the, the, there is such a lot going on. Are about to start. Um, yeah, the big Tonka toys are about to arrive on Pedimore, um, which is going to is it a momentous occasion? Well, no, it's it's disappointing. I suppose we all fought against it, but we are determined to make sure that whatever go, whatever happens on there is for the, the, the good of the, the residents nearby. I have to say that working with, closely with IM, our, our discussions with IM are very encouraging. They're doing a lot with the, the local communities. Um, we've heard earlier from, from John about uh, funding that's available in the Commonwealth Games. I know that IM have also got uh, social funding projects and, and funds available for, for for some projects as well. 
Um, and and also, you know, we, we, when we spoke to uh, IM, uh, the other thing that I was keen to do is to get the schools uh, involved as well. Um, there was a, a report on on uh, the radio today that yeah, construction is is currently seen as such a yeah for many many years has been portrayed as a as a, as a, an industry not to get into, and now we're short of tradesmen and and stuff like that. And I think yeah, we can use the big Tonka toys uh, to to encourage children to to see that as a possible way forward as well. So I think mean, there's we we will and we are determined to make best use of everything that's going on across the world. Right, thanks, Kate. Well, um, I think we we sort of we covered the agenda. And if there aren't any other questions, I think we'll just thank you all for attending and thanks for your contributions. They've all been valuable, and we look forward to meeting in person soon. Uh, and uh, I'll call the meeting to an end. And thank you very much again. OK, thank you, David. good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Very good. Cheers, then. See you tomorrow, Terry. <laughs> Indeed, yes. OK, Derek. <laughs>